This is Douglas Edwards, bringing you Retrospect, a film excursion into past events, events which form the patterns by which we live today. Retrospect is brought to you by the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization in cooperation with your local civil defense office and your local station. And now here's your host, Douglas Edwards. When man first watched a bird transcend the heavens in defiance of gravity, he became obsessed by the desire to fly. From that day on, man's yearning for adventure joined forces with his sense of the wacky and for centuries on end produced one fiasco after another. Man was puzzled by his failure. After all, the bird made it look so easy. Was it because the bird had wings where man had none? Sir James Berry, the English dramatist who sent Peter Pan flying into Never Never Land, offered this theory on man's failure to conquer the skies. The reason birds can fly and we can't is simply that they have perfect faith, for to have faith is to have wings. But if Berry was all for faith, there remained those who were strictly for the birds. For these intrepid souls, time marched ever onward, but never upward. Apparently, everyone thought Barry was crazy. What man needed was not more faith, but more wings. This gentleman proved that seven wings could make anything fly, except an airplane, that is. If this gentleman didn't have faith, he certainly had rugged determination. He knew exactly where he was going. But he was never able to say that half the fun was getting there. As everyone knows, the Wright brothers came along in 1903 to separate the men from the boys. Man at last had achieved sustained flight. But like a cat with a captured mouse, man had to tinker with his new toy before getting down to serious business. Nowhere did he have more fun with it than in France. The French seemed to think that someone had invented a new sport. In Paris, box planes were introduced, presumably to go with box lunches. There didn't seem to be any other reason. Frenchmen jumped at every opportunity to explore the wild blue yonder. It seemed everybody was doing it. Even women tried to get into the act. One Frenchman hit upon the idea of a flying bus. Flying passengers would come later, much later. The French aviator Pigou had no end of new ideas up his sleeve. In 1913, he conducted an experiment with anchor cables for landing purposes. This same principle would be used years later on aircraft carriers. The serious-minded Pegu became one of the first men to make a successful parachute jump. Then, just as others were beginning to take this aviation business seriously, Monsieur Pegu had to go and show everyone how to do a loop, and the airplane continued to be a great big plaything. One Parisian dropped his single-motor job on a storeroom. Nobody seems to know why. Young French sergeant flew his plane through the Arch of Triumph and almost got his wings clipped. On the serious side, man recorded amazing progress in the field of aviation over the incredibly short span of 50 years. In commerce, military strategy, weather forecasting, in almost every field, the airplane has brought about revolutionary change. Man looks now beyond the skies to the boundless reaches of outer space. He will succeed not because he is a very stubborn creature, but because he has an undiminishing faith in his own destiny. So much for the past, and now a word about you and your family. All of us have heard defeatists tell us that there is no hope that no one can expect to survive a nuclear war. This is not true. However devastating a nuclear war would be, we can survive. We've never been a nation to throw up our hands in despair when things had to be done. Today, there are things we must do, actions we must take as individuals and as communities to assure our survival. The Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization has proven that simple, inexpensive home shelters could save the majority of our people from radioactive fallout in case of nuclear war. But what about the other aspects of radiation? What would radioactive fallout do to our food and water? 
Do we take shelter only to find later that all our food is contaminated and our water impure? Uh, do we survive in a shelter only to starve later? Well, Mr. Charles Schaefer, Director of Radiological Defense Plans in the Office of Civil Defense Mobilization, is here to answer these questions for us. Mr. Schaefer, your office suggests that we all store a two-week food and water supply in our shelters. Now, I assume that this food would be safe from fallout radiation, but even with careful rationing, that two-week supply has its limits. What would we do for food later? The purpose of the fallout shelter is not to protect food, Mr. Edwards. It is to protect you. Radiation is not dangerous to canned foods, food in jars, or food in other sealed containers. Nor is it dangerous to the food in your refrigerators or on your cupboard shelves. Radiation is only dangerous to living things. Then most of the food stored in homes and groceries and warehouses would be safe from radiation, Mr. Schaefer? Right, but as an additional protective measure, we suggest that any jar or can which may have been exposed to fallout be washed or thoroughly wiped before opening. This is to prevent the radioactive particles on the outside from contaminating the contents of the can. What about uh, food left exposed, such as uh, fresh fruit or vegetables? Well, actually, any food exposed may collect radioactive particles, and this could be dangerous if eaten. However, there are many very simple ways of decontaminating food. Let me show you what I mean. Here we have a few standard items, a banana, a head of lettuce, and some canned goods. First, I shall check this banana with the Geiger counter to make sure that it has no contamination on it. Next, I shall deliberately contaminate the banana with this radioactive solution. This is not dangerous, but it is mildly radioactive. And when I again check it with the Geiger counter, you can tell by the clicks that it is radioactive. Now watch. I shall carefully peel the banana, check it again for contamination, mm -hmm. find that it is safe, and eat it. No change in the taste either, I take it. <laughs> Very good. However, the contamination is still on the banana peel. Therefore, I shall put this in the plastic bag to prevent spreading the contamination then uh, you can simply decontaminate the fruit by peeling it. Is that the process? This is true with any thick-skinned fruit, such as a banana or an orange. However, there are equally effective methods for decontaminating other foods. For instance, with a head of cabbage or lettuce, one would simply strip off the outside leaves, put them out of harm's way, and wash the lettuce carefully, as any housewife normally does. With canned foods, one would wash the can or wipe off the outside carefully to prevent getting the contamination on the outside into the food. Thus, as you can see, Mr. Edwards, the radiation picture is not all black. In fact, if you do the proper things, it becomes quite manageable. Thank you very much, Mr. Schaefer. There is much we can learn about dealing with radiation, but we must learn what to do now to prepare ourselves for survival in the nuclear age. One of the few Latin American nations in which revolution is a thing of the past is our closest neighbor to the south, Mexico. The last major political upheaval in Mexico started in 1910 and did not finally resolve itself until 1921 when the present democratic system took form. The most famous and colorful of Mexico's revolutionists was Francisco Pancho Villa. The years and the movies have been kind to Pancho Villa. Hollywood has preferred to show us a scowling bad man loaded down with gun belts and expensive sombreros behind whose gun belts there beat a heart as big as a medicine ball. On celluloid, Pancho Villa emerged more a romantic than a revolutionist. And most Americans gradually forgot that had once almost caused a war between the United States and Mexico. Pancho Villa called himself a constitutionalist. When fighting broke out between rebels and government forces in 1910, Mexico had for 34 years lived under the iron rule of Porfirio Diaz. The time was ripe for widespread revolt. But for the next 11 years, 
the various revolutionary groups maintained conflicting goals, what began as a revolution would often seem more like a many-sided civil war. In 1914, a movement headed by provincial governor Carranza gained control of the government. Pancho Villa, distrustful of Carranza's motives, led a march on Mexico City in October. Carranza and his generals left the capital temporarily as Villa's army occupied all of northern Mexico. Five months of bloody warfare followed between Mexican Federals and Villa's forces. In March of 1915, Pancho Villa was decisively beaten at the Battle of Celaya and retreated into the hills. During this period, public outrage was aroused in the United States when a number of innocent American nationals were wounded and killed by Villa's men. United States recognition of the Carranza government in October 1915 left Pancho Villa frustrated in his ambitions and unable to obtain any more arms from this country. Three months later, in retaliation, Villa and his men crossed the border and raided the town of Columbus, New Mexico, committing mass murder. The press and the public demanded that Villa be captured and punished. While diplomatic notes were being exchanged between the Carranza government and Washington, several cavalry units were ordered to the Mexican border. Carranza then issued an order for the defense of Mexican soil. At the risk of war, President Wilson dispatched fully equipped units of cavalry and infantry into Mexico on a punitive expedition. One week after Pancho Villa's raid on United States territory, General John Pershing and 6,000 American troops crossed the international bridge and entered Mexico. Pershing's troops remained in Mexico for 10 months, during which time the 24th Infantry Division occupied the city of Juarez. The punitive expedition never did fight Villa's army. It was nowhere to be found. Villa was shrewd enough to avoid a showdown with a force which had him greatly outnumbered. But if he never clashed with American troops, he did cause Mexican-American relations to reach an all-time low. Not until long after American troops were withdrawn would normal relations exist once again between the two nations. In 1920, Villa surrendered his army to a new government of agrarian reform. He was assassinated in 1923. Before we close today, a further reminder that we can defeat the potential threat of radioactive fallout after a nuclear attack. But we must take the necessary steps now to protect our homes and our families. For information on how you can survive a nuclear attack, contact your local civil defense office or write to OCDM, Battle Creek, Michigan. Be sure to be with me next time we bring you Retrospect. Till then, this is Douglas Edwards saying goodbye for now. Retrospect, starring Douglas Edwards, was brought to you by the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization in cooperation with your local civil defense office and your local station. Survival in the nuclear age is a personal responsibility, touching every American family. Make sure you take part. Learn the facts about civil defense preparedness. Start your home preparedness program today. The prepared family builds a prepared nation. Civil defense is an American tradition.